morning to you all. And welcome to our webinar entitled Business, Startup, and Expansion. My name is Marjorie Wharton, and I am your host for this session this morning. My business is entitled Breakthrough Performance Coaching. And one of the things that uh, we have established to do is really bring to the community the knowledge of experts, the experience, the capabilities and skills that can be a benefit to those of us in the community who want to expand our abilities, our skills, and our potential to be successful and to continue growing in that way. And so this event, like so many others of the events that I have been producing or have been sharing with the community of lit is really intended to bring an expert on board who collaborates with my organization so that we can offer an event like this. And so the focus today, as you can tell from the title, is really on looking at the, what is required in order to successfully establish, if you're in the startup phase, establish your business, or what are some of the steps that you can take to grow if you're already established, you're going along and you perhaps want to not only grow, but maybe even consolidate various initiatives that you have going and running concurrently. And so joining me today, collaborating on this initiative is the one and only Mr. Richard Blades. Known far and wide as Richie B, he's very proud of saying that. Of course, I knew him before he was at celebrity status where he could shorten his name. So I still take the privilege of referring to him sometimes as Richard. Hi, Richie B. <laughs> Hi, hello, and good morning, Marjorie. Good morning, everyone. All right, such a pleasure to have you here. So Richard is an entrepreneur, and he has been an entrepreneur for, I swear, as many years as I've known him. And I never admit anymore to how long I've known anybody because it ages me. But it has been years and Richard has been sharing information, sharing wisdom, sharing ideas about what it takes to establish and grow business. He's a business development specialist. He's done so as an employee in hospitality, um, as a teacher and trainer, working with salespeople, working with various industries across the region and across the world. He's very proud of saying that even though he resides in Barbados, he really caters to the global communities. And so, our facilitator today, Mr. Richard N.A. Blades, known far and wide as Richie B. I am going to hand over to you, sir. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Marjorie. Welcome again, everyone. Uh, today, I promise you three E's, to be exciting, entertaining, and educational. Um, what we are going to be doing is taking you through what it takes to be in business, even if you're from a startup stage, and if you are already existing, how to expand it. Now, it's a lot of material. It's way more than what we can accomplish within the time frame. But however, not to worry, we have taken care of everything so that you don't have to worry about taking notes or anything of the sort, because we've have everything ready for you online, on your devices, and you'll be seeing everything momentarily. Here, just a bit of housekeeping. You have the presentation link where this presentation is stored right at the top there. So you can copy that down so you can log on onto your devices, put that link in and you can get it. Then we'll be working with slides and something I developed called a toolkit, which is a closed website that I've developed and put a lot of information on just for you. Now I have taken note of who is going to be attending, so to speak, in terms of the categories of employment and also where you're from, so that I can tailor the examples that I'm going to use to suit so that you get maximum benefit. As you have questions coming on in, what will happen is that Marjorie will indicate to me that there are questions there where I can then look at addressing your questions within the program rather than waiting until the end. All right, now within the material, there are hyperlinks, especially in the toolkit. And there's reference in material as well. So you're gonna have videos, you're gonna have reading material, you can basically have homework. Our contact details are at the end of today's slide deck and possibly also in the toolkit for your ease of reference so that you will know how to get in contact with us at the end. We will use examples applicable to your fields so that when you're here today, you leave, you can have information that you could pretty much apply within 24 to 48 hours and start to see an experience result. So without any further ado, let's go into what we're gonna be doing today. 
For today, we're going to be looking at what are the requirements for beginning a business. You're going to be looking at the expansion and you really got to ask yourself, are we ready for it? We're going to be looking at the strategies and operations required for running a business. And then right here, there's a hyperlink for the toolkit. So once you download and you access the link for the slides, you automatically have this toolkit link embedded. So all you need to do is click on it. All right. Great. Now, in terms of starting a business, what are some of the requirements? But let me step back here a little bit, come out from this presentation and go to the toolkit. This is your toolkit. So here, what I'm gonna do is everything that's in the presentation, I'm gonna be coming over here to the toolkit, breaking everything down for you uh, so that you don't miss a beat. So what are requirements for starting a business? Well, first and foremost, you have to determine the type of business that you would want to have. What is the strategy behind you setting up your business the way how it is? How are you going to set it up? A lot of people tend to go for the sole proprietorship because here in Barbados, it's just $104. You get a business name, you can open a bank account, and you can start doing business. However, we're going to discuss in just a little bit why that might not be necessarily the best way of setting up your operation. You have a partnership, and you have two types of partnership. The general partnership, and you also have what is called the limited partnership. And again, we're going to go into those a little bit deeper. You have the limited liability entity, and then you also have a corporation. In terms of a sole proprietorship, that's when it's just going to be you getting into business. It gives you an opportunity to try the business and see if there is any commercial viability in it, if it's something that you even like. But the thing about it is that it exposes you to liability. What do I mean by liability? A lot of people that would be your customers, they tend to have a, a liking for the name and it's a female name and it's called Sue. So what would happen if you had to get sued by someone is that you can lose your shirt because this is the most vulnerable form of business type that you can have. It is usually common here and many other parts of the world. A lot of people just use it and, you know, with the intention of starting the business and then going on to another stage, but they don't get to do it. The other thing is, when you have a sole proprietorship, when the owner of that sole proprietorship dies, the business dies with them. There's no transferability to that business. You can also see the same thing with a partnership to a certain extent. It is not as limited, but if you have a general partnership, it's the most vulnerable way of doing business as well, because one partner going signing off on anything can make the entire body of people in that partnership liable for the promises that were established or the agreements that were established by that partner. So one of the better ways is to establish what is called a limited partnership where you identify the unlimited partner would be who is actively involved in the business. And then the other limited partners would have a nominal level at which they would have made their investment and but they will be protected from a liability standpoint up to the level of their investment. You have a limited liability entity where you actually offer shares. And then finally, we come all the way right through to a corporation. And what I am going to do is just click here to corporate affairs. We are in Barbados. We would go, we call it Kaipo, which is short, which means corporate affairs and intellectual property office. They are linked with many entities and pretty much know anything and everything in business go through here in order to ensure that you're protected, registered, and you have to, in some cases, that depending on the type of business that you do have or the type of entity, as you say, not just business, because NGOs also have to register here as well as charities. You would then be able to see all the different entities that you interact with. You would have your protection. You know what your license fees are when the year comes. All of those sorts of things will be made available to you. Now, they have a website which that was the website I just showed you, but I am going to come back now and show you some additional stuff in terms of when you're registering your business. You remember just now I would have spoken about the $104 for the registration process if you're going to be doing a sole project. Now here, this is going to give you all of the fees. So this is the approximate fees. They can change quite easily. I am going to go here and show you all of them. So you here you will see that there's all the fees and everything like that. All the types of businesses are done under the various acts governing the types of operations that you have. And they have everything covered from starting up the business all the way right through to when you're going to close the business down. And I keep saying business, but it's really entity. All right. 
So you have the Companies Act, and you can see that there are various elements applicable to the Companies Act. Then as we move on down, I'm just going to do this quickly because you can always go back and do this on your own. I'm doing this in the interest of time. So you have the registration of the business names, which is $100 to register your business name, but the $4 is the VAT. That's why you get $104. As you're coming down, you get the bill of sale. So if you're going to be selling items like property, cars, all that sort of thing, you would have to go through here and, you know, to get different documentation in order to ensure that the transference of ownership is done correctly. You have the pharmacy app. Yes, you cannot just set up a pharmacy just like that. You have to go through and register it properly and appropriately. It must be inspected first in order to ensure that you can set up the pharmacy, you know, proper manner, especially since you're dealing with prescription drugs. With the limited partnership, what is happening is you get some liability protection, just like if you had a company but rather than paying thousands of dollars, you pay $2.40 and you lost a partnership agreement, which shows the unlimited partners, the limited partners, what their contributions are and up to what level. And that is something that is done by you with your attorney and then it is lodged and you pay the $2.40. and Coming on down, you have a news registration of newspaper. You have the trade unions. Yes, they also have to be registered as well. Now, when you're deciding on your business, they have a number of systems that you should consider. A business is like a human body where we comprise of the circulatory system, the respiratory system, the lymphatic system, etc. A business also has a variety of systems. Richard. Yes. We have a question in the chat. Someone is asking if one has multiple business ideas and businesses to launch, what is your perspective on a holding company? In your experience, is it better to do it on startup or after the various businesses have been registered? It all comes down to your strategy and the competence of your team to deal with all these things. If you're going to be trying to do it on your own, it can get a little bit hairy in terms of all the fees and everything like that that you have to be pulling out, as I just showed you for the fee structure. Business is a team sport, as we're going to discuss in a little bit. So you're going to need to have teams in order to ensure that you're not overwhelmed. I've seen people come to me and they have books of businesses. The thing about it is that you've got to treat it like an elephant, where you eat it one bite at a time. If you try to force it all, you're going to overwhelm yourself and crumble. Now, that being said, you don't want to be too premature in setting up a holding company unless you have the funds to do so. Because for every company that you do have, you're going to have annual filings. When you get to a certain level of revenue, you're going to have to have audited income statements or audit reviews, depending on what is happening there. You're going to also have to ensure that you have compliance with what is called the Employee Rights Act in case you're going to be recruiting employees. And this includes even somebody who's coming on the outside of your premises just to do a daily clean. You have to ensure that you can prove without a shadow of doubt that they are just coming to do your work just for you, but they also have other clients. So they're not an employee of yours. They are a service provider. And you need to have a different documentation in place to prove that. The Employee Rights Act is that the employees have all the rights. The employers don't necessarily have that. So in terms of the holding company, again, it needs to be structured because what is the holding company going to be holding? Is it just an umbrella thing? And then your businesses that are going to come underneath it, are they interrelated? Are they separate and diverse? Do they complement each other? What is going to be your strategy? If you can tell me a little bit more about that, maybe I can zero in a bit more to provide more in-depth help. So then I would suggest maybe that individual they require additional clarification, maybe can reach out to you directly. We have another question. What type of structure would you recommend for a consultant? Okay, is a consultant a standalone consultant or is the consultant a part of a consulting body? Yes, standalone. Okay, depending on the industry that you are in, you can either be an incorporated entity because remember as a consultant, you're advising people as a consulting entity about things that are going to impact impact the livelihoods of the client and therefore you're taking on that risk yeah you're industry be, is marketing industry is marketing you know in marketing there's a saying and especially from my days back in marketing my bosses always used to say at the time you know marketing today you're a king tomorrow you could be a dog because if you do something that works out well and they make a lot of money in that day great 
But then if you don't, then you could very well end up being in a situation where the first thing that could happen is that you're seen as an expense rather than being an asset, right? Mm -hmm. So if you are in marketing, what has to happen is that you've got to be on your A game. You've got to know your stuff. You've got to know your reputation. And you also have to have at least 10 clients. We're going to cover that in a little bit as to why I say 10. In terms of the structure, are you working locally? Are you working internationally? You can start up first as a sole proprietorship since it's just you. But then if you are in a market that or operating in an arena that has a lot of litigation, it will be best to protect yourself and your personal assets unless you want to put your personal assets underneath an entity that manages your personal asset so that you're not exposed, right? Does that help you? Or do you want me to go in a little bit further? Responses, thank you. That helps? Okay, great. Perfect. Where was I? You were going on to systems. I was going on to systems. Thank you so much. There are at least seven things that you should know about systems when you're going in the business. Let me see if I can get those up here for you. Here we go. So when you're in business, you got to have a document and filing system. Why? Because you are going to be handling a lot of information and you've got to be organized in the way how you process that information, how you receive it, process it, the throughput of it. And then when your business delivers, you got to know what has been delivered and what is still in process and everything like that. So that you know where you are at all times, just like your speedometer. So I always say that a business must have good administrative practices when you're talking about the document documents and your filing. Note taking, getting orders correct, getting information accurate, ensuring that you're understanding what the client wants is key and critical. So your ability to take notes so that you can check back those notes, see that you're on target, check what you've written back with the person who is giving the information before you move from their presence is always ideal. Or if you can't get it done that way, you send them back correspondence saying, this is what I understood from our discussion. When you do that, what is happening is that you're ensuring that you are as close as possible to batting 1000 and that when you deliver, you're pretty much on target, on time, and with everything that is required to be delivered. And on budget is the other thing because you want to ensure that you fall within the budget so you can plan out your strategy when you're dealing with these things on behalf of the client. Now, when you come down to the appointments, a lot of people nowadays have smartphones. Pretty much everyone has a smartphone. They have laptops. They have all these sorts of things. They load them up with appointments sometimes. They don't use them properly. They miss appointments. Sometimes they book appointments too close. Thankfully for COVID, you've had a situation where you don't have the commute times included. But what has happened is that you've become overwhelmed with a whole plethora of meetings coming in where the times are clashing in many instances. Scheduling can be a task in and of itself, and in particularly if you're working on your own. So you've got to be very good with knowing how to manage your time in order to ensure that you're not overwhelmed. If you have to be going out to meet clients like the way how we did before COVID, one of the things I used to do is I would do appointments in a particular zone, which would help me get from one appointment to the other efficiently rather than going all the way up to the north of the island, coming back down to the south or then having to go across to the eastern side of the island. You zone the area so that you're working in one particular area on a daily basis and then you come around, you plan your week out like that. Appointments and scheduling are key. When is your cutoff time at the end of the day? Are you dealing with people in different time zones? That's something that I have to deal with on a daily basis because I deal with people in different time zones. I live locally, I work globally, as you would have heard Marjorie say to you at the beginning. Then you have what is called projects. Some of you might work by project, some of you work by task. And then you've got to learn how to prioritize everything. There's a saying in the dental field where they look at rock, pebble, sand. And the analogy is, if you take your day, how are you prioritizing? So the day is a glass. If you fill your glass with a whole lot of sand, you really don't have a whole lot of time to do everything else because the sand would be like your bread and butter work that just comes on in. It's not terribly expensive, but you're loading up your day with appointments. And then at the end of the day, you're left wondering if you paid to work as opposed to being paid to work. Then the rocks would be like the bigger project that are lucrative. You want a couple of those in, but then they're still going to leave some gaps so that if you only have that type of activity coming in exclusively, you're going to have what can be deemed as feast or famine in that your project might finish and then you have a lull in between the time that the next project starts and you have no income coming in. The pebbles are the things that can come in between, but you don't want to get pigeonhole or what the actors will call typecast into a particular area that you're only known in a limited capacity. So you have to be so very careful about the types of projects that come on in. And your projects have to make sense. 
sense in that once you make sense, you will make dollars. And why that is key is because at the end of the day, regardless of what business that you're in, it has to be sustainable. You have to make money. You have to make profit. Too many entrepreneurs I find are afraid to talk about profit. And the first thing they want to do when they get into a meeting to negotiate with somebody is offer a discount and leave money on the table. And the person that they might be meeting with might not have even asked for a discount. And in the instance that they do, you've still got to be very careful because some people would ask for discounts. You give them the discount and then they want to pay you late, which then pushes up your cost of the project because you're trying to do collections. You know, if you're not careful, the collection cost could actually come up to what you're trying to collect in terms of the revenue that was supposed to be coming in. So you've got to be so very careful when you're looking at your systems pertaining to the types of projects that you're taking on. Like for example, I don't do retainers anymore at all because I once had an experience where I had a company that was on retainer and the leadership there thought that they had to call every single day because they were on retainer, even if they had nothing to ask. And it became a nuisance. So I terminated the relationship with them. I just moved on to another place where I dealt with more clients. And that's why I always say it is always good when you're going to be working out here like this in entrepreneurship capacity, particularly Particularly if you're going to be a consultant or advisory capacity, you must have 10 paying clients minimum, and they must be paying at decent rates so that you can sustain yourself and your business, and you can still save some money to do things, all right? I find that too many people, like just yesterday, I heard about somebody who was doing business plans. That person was on campus around the same time I was, and they are well quali qualified, they're bright and everything like that, but I find that they're afraid to talk money. And they were charging through the floor for business plans. And I'm like, why? What is it that you're doing that you're all the way down there in terms of your pricing? And they were afraid to add value on, and they saw themselves as a commodity. So therefore, their clients would also view them as being a commodity as well. So how you view yourself is going to come all the way right through in everything that you do, be it your email, your communication, your messages your dress, your deportment, all of those sorts of things are going to come out. So how is your team communicating to the people in terms of the spoken word, the written word, and how they see you? Sometimes the best ad for your business is when people see you, when people interact with you. Are you coming across as being professional? Are you coming across as being knowledgeable? Do you have a presence about your business that lets people know that you know what you're doing? Then in terms of finances, are you making money? Are you helping others to make money? When people do business with you, do they save money or earn more money than they would have ordinarily through the use of your services? Are they acquiring assets that help them in the growth of their business? So if you are a trainer and you're going out there and you're doing training, for example, with sales and marketing teams, are those teams then going out and have the capacity then to increase the earning ability of the entity that you just trained? Are they helping the entity that you just trained retain more of the business so that they're reloading business of clients that they would have served before? All of these are things that you do to help add value to your clients' operations. And by extension, your operations would benefit from it as well. If I can just go forward, in terms of your vision, plan, goals, and balance, what's happening there? Do you have a vision for your business? Too often, we as business people spend too much time working in our businesses and not working on our businesses. And there's a difference. Working in your business is that when you're caught up in the activity of busyness, you're so busy trying to serve other people that you don't try to put things in place so that you can work more effectively and efficiently in order to be able to serve your clients well and also be able to shorten the time within which you can do it. Why do you think that more people would pay a higher cost to get a letter from one point to another using a courier service as opposed to using the regular post system. You've got to look at your personal productivity. When you get home at the end of the day, what have you accomplished? Now, home for me is easy, especially in these days of COVID. I just pick up Two Dog Avenue and I go to work. And people say, Two Dog Avenue, where is that? Well, it's the side of my house because I go downstairs. And then when I'm done, I pick up Two Dog Avenue to come back home. But at the end of the at the end of the day, I've got to know, was it productive? Did it align or surpass what I had planned for the day? Did I even have a plan for the day? Did I have a plan for the week? What is my traveling rate for the month in terms of how my plans are matching up against my actuals? 
And these are questions that you have to sit down and have with your management team, even if it means that your management team is just you, you're having a meeting in front of the mirror. How are you valuing yourself, your time, your efforts, and your resources? 